Okay, we will get started now. I just want to welcome everyone back to this uh, session where we have an hour session here on track two for a question and answer research session with uh, some very familiar faces. We have Dr. Leora Fox, Dr. Lauren Byrne, and Dr. Ark Johnson. Uh, HG Research has had some knocks over the past 12 months, and but also, of course, a lot of progress too. And now is your chance to ask any research questions that you might have. Uh, to this panel. In the session, you can type your questions into the um, either the Q&A function or the, the chat function, and they'll be discussed by our presenters. Um, we'll begin with an intro from our presenters, and then you can we'll get started with your questions. Go ahead. Thank you. I, I can start off. Um, I'm Dr. Lauren Byrne. I am a HD researcher at University College London, and I I'm also on the board for HDO, so uh, representing our research committee. Um, I specialize in uh, what we call biomarkers, so the, and specifically biomarkers in, in blood and, and spinal fluid. Um, so I'm really interested in kind of outcome measures and how we run clinical trials and early detection of disease and, and things like that. Um, Eric, do you want to go? Sure. Hey, thanks, Lauren. Thanks, Jen. Um, hi everyone, my name is Eric Johnson. I am the Chief Mission Officer for the Huntington's Disease Society of America and just joined the team in November of last year. So claim to be the new guy still, it's only been about four months. But prior to that, I served as a clinical psychologist at the HDSA Center of Excellence at UCLA, working directly with people living with HD and their families for about 17 and a half years. Uh, prior to taking on this role. Um, I also served on the board of trustees for HDSA for about 10 and just really excited to be a part of this conversation this morning, talking about any and all things going on in the research, but also being able to share a little bit of my clinical perspective in, uh, in how that relates to what's going on in, in trials and in the basic sciences too. So thanks so much for having me all. Hi everyone, I am Leora Fox. I am the Assistant Director of Research and Patient Engagement at the Huntington's Disease Society of America. And I am also on the editorial and writing board of HD Buzz. So um, in my role at HDSA, I, I manage our research programs, our, our grants programs. Um, and I'm, uh, I also oversee how we help to incorporate family voices into the drug development process and I oversee our research communication. So everything we do to make research understandable to folks. And that's really um, one of my passions and I'm very happy to be here. And I do that in my capacity at, at HD Buzz as well. So uh, please do ask us some questions, um, but maybe we can kind of chat about last week's uh, CHDI meeting a little bit because we were all in attendance there mm -hmm. and it's kind of the, the biggest gathering of HD scientists that happens yearly. Mm -hmm. um, and there were for anyone who really doesn't know, um, so CHDI are a nonprofit organization that funds specifically Huntington's disease research. And they do a lot of forcing, you know, the community to collaborate and they work directly with, um, not forcing, it's, it's a community that finds it easy to collaborate, but um, but also make, uh, matching people who might not have met with each other that are doing similar things or that could collaborate, um, as well as linking the kind of basic science to the, the pharma companies and, and getting those drugs and translating that into the clinic. So they're hugely important. And at this conference, it's called the HD Therapeutics Conference. Um, it's a really exciting um, amalgamation of some of the really the most exciting basic science that's happening that could lead to therapeutics, um, biomarker research, and also updates from all of the pharma companies. So there's a lot of exciting things. I don't know if either of you two have any particular highlights. So many, right? I think. Yeah, <laughs> tons. <laughs> it was, it was a, I think even personally, it was just such a wonderful, it was um, for most people, um, the last conference, in-person conference they had um, was the this conference two years ago before COVID. And it's the first time we've all been together and it does make such a huge impact on the science and the ability to communicate and talk about things. I feel like everybody was really um, 
I find like concentrate more on the science and get more excited and and, and see things how things work better. So um, even from that perspective, it was exciting just to be in person with our kind of international HD extended HD family um, of these like professionals. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, HD Buzz it was live tweeting all of the scientific sessions. So if you haven't um, taken a look at that yet, it's a really great way to kind of get a, a summary of everything that's going on. My, my colleagues, HD Buzz, the wonderful Ed and Jeff, as well as uh, Sarah Hernandez and um, Rachel Harding. Um, and we've all got very different sorts of expertise and and we're covering the stuff that you know we we understood the best because there's so much going on um but yeah definitely check that out i feel like um you know maybe a good way to sort of um encourage some questions and i see that maybe there are some coming in um yeah mm -hmm. there were some sort of major overarching topics of the conference which included things like huntington lowering uh, somatic expansion, which is this idea that CAG repeats can actually increase over time in certain cells in the brain. I see there's a question coming in about that. So maybe we can start there. Uh, yeah, there mm -hmm. were also updates, as Lauren mentioned, from um, different pharmaceutical companies and also lots of innovative approaches that are maybe not, you know, yet in the clinic for, for, Huntington's disease, but that could be in, you know, the next few years or so. So if you have questions in any of those realms, we are, it's hot off the presses, all of that stuff. So, um, Hey, Leora, I want to so, just say something real quick. Uh, I think what, what you say, first and foremost, for all of you all who haven't read the HD buzz Twitter feed that covered the convention or covered mm -hmm. the conference, I was sitting a couple of rows behind them and watching it the entire time because yeah. There was so much. Heavy I don't know how you science. guys do it. I oh honestly God. don't. It's it's it, it is a heroic effort seeing them pipe everything, and um, you know, we're just trying to get our heads around the stuff mm -hmm. as it's coming in, and they're managing to put it into information that's that's understandable. And you know, I go back and look at the HD Buzz recap <laughs> as <Yeah>. a scientist. <laughs> um, but if, I if do anybody, too. There's a lot of us, right? You know, yeah, it's a team yeah. effort. One person's writing, one person's editing, one person's tweeting. Yeah. It's 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 a lot of fun. Yeah, no, it's really great to see how much you guys have grown over the years. And um, I for anybody who's interested in the hardcore original um, presentation, they will be um, most of them will be available in in the coming. I think mm -hmm. they um, CHI always put the material online. Um, a few uh, month or two after I think they're trying to get out as soon as possible because this was um in person and um a lot of people who wanted to be there weren't there um so they've they're committed to putting that online and, and we will um tweet about that if when they come available so um if you, if you miss that um we'll hopefully get that out to people if you if you really keen to see the the um the hardcore presentations I think the conference structure was also really interesting with how the presentations went from talking about some of the very kind of the basic science things. How does, uh, how do things work on a cellular level? What are the things that we're still learning about how Huntington's disease works in the brain and other cells in the body? And then the, so it, it started that way, but then it progressed to these are the things that are translating from the bench science towards clinic. And talking about things like Lauren brought up with biomarkers, what can we, what can we dis, what can we look at that will tell us what's happening when we apply clinical interventions? And then really wrapping up the uh, conference, talking about some of these, com having companies present on their interventions that are coming to clinical trials now. I think you have heard about them a lot. Just even earlier today, I seeing who was talking. Um, about some of the things that are coming up and some of the things that are going into the trials now. Um, it was just, it's, it's fascinating when you think about it. You know, we all are very hopeful. What's the thing that is going to change a person's experience in living with Huntington's disease? So to hear that, but then also to be really aware of the fact that there's still so much that we are learning about how things work in people's brains, in their cells. And to have both of those things happening at the same time and really getting to see them in parallel and in that kind of paradigm, if you will, 
was really amazing. Mm -hmm. Kind of like so, so the first question that's come that has come in is in light of problems like somatic expansion and effects on mRNA. How much sense do you see in strategies of lowering Huntington? So I think maybe that before we get into kind of answering that, it might be good to talk about um, uh, first somatic expansion, and you touched on it, Laura, Laura but um, what that mm -hmm. actually means, um, and what are I, I have a feeling I know what they mean by in terms of effects on mRNA, and we could touch on some things that came out of the HC sense, um, HC. RTC, um, like uh, Joe Bates' talk on um, splicing and things like that. Um, and then kind of an overview of Huntington lowering strategy as well, because there's so many of them and they're all mm -hmm. targeting disparate, different aspects of the whole thing. So maybe, I don't know where we we'll start with that. Um, maybe I can, maybe yeah. I can expand a little bit about somatic expansion and, and you could talk I was thinking even about... before we get on to somatic expansion we can talk about kind of the central dogma just to remind everyone oh that, sure yeah you know just before we go into like the nitty-gritty of that so mm -hmm. we have DNA which are the most basic kind of instructions or recipe to to build the rest of, of the body and our body is made up of these things called proteins so one gene of, um, which is made of DNA is an instruction to make one protein and but in between there it's a bit more complicated there's um a few steps in between and one of them um like this question asks about um RNA um RNA is um there's a messenger in between the recipe and the final protein in the product uh and it is made up of RNA, which is a, a, a material that's kind of like DNA, but it's slightly different. Um, and it's almost so it's like a copy of the uh, the main instructions that have to be kept safe safe inside the nucleus, and then it's it's transcribed into this this other material that can be taken to the, the cells machinery to make the protein. Um, Sometimes when we talk about um this process of like dna rna protein we talk about having a big recipe book of just like a big old family recipe book of everything that you would want to cook and that's you know your dna mm -hmm. and that's contained in in every cell and then the rna is kind of like a copy of of one recipe that you want to make and then that rna is made into whatever into a protein which is like your your recipe so say you you know you have a cupcake recipe um, and then the idea that, you know, there's this mistake in the DNA, this mistake in the recipe book that, that gets into the, the protein. So in HD, that's uh, too many CAGs in, in one part of the recipe. But you can think of it as like if your old recipe book has, a, says you need to add a tablespoon instead of a teaspoon of baking powder then your recipe is going to have that, you know, you make a copy of it and bring it to your kitchen, then that mistake is going to be there. And then you bake your cupcakes and they, you know, they get, they're, they're way too big, they overflow. And so it's this idea that, you know, how can you in some ways correct that recipe, the DNA or the RNA? Mm -hmm. So, and that's with a lot of these Huntington lowering strategies are, are trying different parts of that that pathway and or that kind of stepwise approach. So whether it's the recipe, the original recipe that they're targeting or the messenger. So um, for example, the antisense oligonucleotides approach are targeting the RNA. Um, and that's uh, approaches that are like the ones from Roche and Common Erson. Um, also Wave Life Sciences use that kind of approach. Um, and then there are other approaches that might be looking at the DNA, um, examples of those might be um, things like zinc fingers, which I don't think are in the clinic yet. Um, I don't know if I'm missing any that are starting to look at DNA, but eventually in the future, there might be trials with things like that. Um, and there's also different types of molecules that means that, or ways of getting that, targeting that kind of the mRNA gets into the body and how, and that's another thing, all these companies are doing different approaches of how to get that, basically targeting the similar stuff, but they have to come at it different ways because there's different types of molecules that need different kinds of 
ways to get into the body. So ASOs are basically like chemically modified DNA and RNA. Um, so they can't be ingested. They can't, they get degraded um, in your stomach juices and, and they don't make it into the, the brain. Um, but uh, so they, that's why they have to go to get them to the brain where we want them. They have to be injected in by a lumbar puncture or spinal tap. Um, uh, you'll hear um, companies talk about an intrafecal injection. And that's all that is. Um, however, there's other approaches like we've heard about today from Novartis, um, which talk about small molecules. Small molecules are simply a, chem a, a smaller chemical that's, um, that, I don't know how to explain this quite well. <laughs> it's small enough um, that it isn't affected by, you know, it doesn't degrade in, in the stomach and it can be ingest, um, digested in and get into the blood and it can also small enough that it can cross the blood brain barrier so its effect can get into the cell the brain cells and, and the neuron and have its effect on lowering Huntington um so I kind of going back to the original question of how does somatic instability sit with that I don't know if you want to talk about that a bit more Lula. sure yeah so there's this there's this approach, this Huntington lowering approach, which you know gets at the the gene itself, and there are other approaches that are getting at the gene itself in different ways. So one of the things that we've kind of discovered in the field, well, it was probably originally introduced uh, 20 years ago, but has, there's been a lot more research about this concept in the last five to 10 years. It's called somatic instability. And this is the idea that, you know, we kind of think of these CAG repeats in the gene as being pretty stable. Like if someone gets a blood test to find out whether they have the HD gene and they have a, a CAG repeat of 42, there's this sort of assumption that that's 42 repeats in every cell of the body. But actually, um, over time in HD, there are certain cells in the body um, especially in the brain and especially in the parts of the brain that are most vulnerable in HD, where those CAG repeats can start to expand. And this happens because of uh, DNA repair. Our DNA is constantly being bombarded with all kinds of things. So um, everything from, you know, oxidative stress, which you might have, have heard of in terms of antioxidants, um, to just the sunlight. And at, you know, thousands of times, hundreds, millions of times, your DNA get, needs to be repaired because it's being used to produce, um, you know, the recipe for the protein. Um, and so our body has these mechanisms for repairing um, DNA. And, and sometimes when you have these very long CAG repeats, um, for, for certain reasons, they can even get longer as, um, as the repair happens, the more CAGs will be added. And so as a person's HD progresses, sometimes there are cells in the brain that have um, many more CAG repeats than they may have started with at birth. Um, and over the past several years, there's some evidence to suggest that the lengthening of CAG repeats in the brain can lead to potentially earlier onset of HD symptoms. And so there are researchers and companies that are working on how do you combat that and either you know, stop that faulty DNA repair machinery or boost it in certain ways um, to make that not happen and, and potentially slow down um, or, or you know, prevent symptoms from happening. Um, and yeah, there's a couple of different companies that are working on this. For example, Triplet Therapeutics spoke at this conference last week. Um, Locus 23 Therapeutics is also working on this concept of somatic instability. So this is just a, it's another kind of a, approach that folks are, are looking at um, that also gets at the genetics of, of HD. And there are certain DNA repair proteins that are being targeted or um, sort of taken away in, in the same kind of lowering genetic sense as you would with Huntington lowering. But I think that the question itself um, was in light of these kind of new approaches with somatic instability and under, our understanding of how Huntington's 
DNA, RNA um, works in the cell. Um, I think I'm not seeing the question anymore, but I think it was, you know, why, why should we continue to focus on Huntington lowering? And I've just talked for way too long. So I don't know, <laughs> I don't know if somebody else wants to. Lauren, well, I think the, the question more was more whether it. there's any concerns or if it matters, um, if, if that should be the way to treat maybe rather than Huntington lowering. Um, my opinion on that is that Huntington lowering would also be related to somatic instability. So um, it, it's all very, so the, the reason that somatic instability is important is all about this like the CAG and that um, the increase of CAG length causes more damage to cells. We know the more Huntington protein is more likely to cause more damage to cells and more aggregation. So I think they're both having an effect on the same kind of toxicity of the end toxicity that is happening um, in different ways. They're both contributing. So I think I envision um, a, a, a future where we have multiple drugs approaching mm -hmm. multiple things and you'll have a cocktail of, of these drugs that help in both ways, similar to cancers, you get all these, you get, they also look at DNA repair and things like that. So I would say it's going to be complementary to Huntington lowering. Um, what will be the real question that we have to find out is when to treat and when to apply each of these paradigms. And there's a lot more research that needs to be done. So we need to show if they're beneficial in any, in any age, it might be to go earlier um need to yeah there's a lot of reasons for doing all of these approaches and i think we've got a few more kind of questions that are similar um so you know Mustafa asked what are our thoughts on the, these new treatment paradigms that involve targeting dna um, repair and mismatch proteins and this process of somatic expansions rather than hunting and lowering so that's kind of summarizing what the original question was um I don't know if either of you have your own opinions on, on that. I, th I, I think you made a couple of really good points. Both of you made a couple of really good points. Uh, Lauren, to what you just said about we are, it is important that we're exploring all of these options right now because they're realistically, as of right now, nothing that's going to be the solution, right? So finding all of the different tools available that we could see go through this uh, clinical trial development process to eventually get treatments to clinic. The more tools we have, the more options we have and the realistic, the, the real, real reality is we're probably gonna be looking at polypharmacy treatment, meaning more than one drug, more than one tool to treat uh, Huntington's disease. I just wanted to throw something out there about somatic expansion, just because I know this is something that I heard a lot in clinic when we would when we would hear presentations on somatic expansion, and then someone would come in and be like, "Oh my God, does that mean that my CAG repeat is getting bigger? And what does that mean?" And I think it's important to say we're we're talking about this on a cellular level. We're not talking about you know the when you go in for your um, for your HD testing and the number that you get back, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is happening on, in a very small way in the different parts of the brain, the different cells. And like Leora said, it's because there's so many different things happening. There's so many different mechanisms that happen that could lead to this, this expansion within different cell types and how does that play out? But, you know, kind of going back to this question, all of these things tie into each other. Like Lauren said, Huntington lowering is important because even when somatic expansion is happening, it's creating these mutant proteins that are going to aggregate. So how do we lower those, right? So they all they all do relate. I just like to say, you know, somatic expansion isn't saying this is what's going down and how it's going to affect your next generation. It's what's going on just on that cellular level. It's also important to know that the idea that somatic expansion and DNA repair are linked is still uh, a hypothesis in terms of um, this has come from findings in genome-wide association studies. We know that certain um, modifiers are found that are, are in several of the DNA repair genes 
we also know separately that there is somatic instability, meaning that in people that have Huntington's disease, when you look at their brain, certain regions have all these like hundreds of CAG repeats and expansion in very specific regions that we know to be affected in, in HD. Um, so this link is a very intuitive link, but it, it's not necessarily being shown that the DNA repair pathway is causing that or link, but you know, there's a lot of evidence building towards that and it does make, you know, I do believe in it, but it's important to, to realize that this is still a hypothesis that needs to be tested. Um, it's a hard thing to kind of prove what comes first and what causes the other. Um, there's other interesting findings coming out of genetics, like I, it, if we saw, um, talk about Darren Monkston, Monkton's talk, um, where they're, they're, um, they're diving in deeper at the Huntington protein or the DNA of the Huntington gene itself. We all know about these repeated CAGs, but it's not quite as simple as that as, as what we find. I, it, a lot of things with HD, it's, it's more complex. Um, but what we've learned is that there's actually another um, three letters that, that happened before the last CAG repeat called CAA, which also call, codes polyglutamine, the same building block that, that gets put into the protein. Um, but for some reason, having these little letters makes the structure more um, stable. Um, so, or at least this is kind of the theory um, where people that have this missing had much earlier um, age of onset, um, where people that had extra repeat, so two of BCAA had a later onset. So this is showing, you know, and that, this is all stuff that links to the same theory that um, there might be more expansion and more somatic instability in those people with, with these, and it's the same hypothesis as the DNA repair pathway. So um, yeah, I think it's just important to highlight that a lot of these are, we're linking it to what the most intuitive answer could be rather than a definitive we, we still haven't shown in patients if you treat DNA repair pathways that it's going to um, slow down somatic expansion. And they're trying to do some of this stuff now in animal models. And that's what a lot of the preclinical work will be um, with these new drugs that are targeting components of the DNA repair pathway. But um, yeah, it's a difficult thing to, to look at. And it's a difficult thing, particularly in patients, because it's hard to prove in a living patient that there's somatic instability in their brain because we can't do a brain biopsy um so that's a big you know for me as a biomarker person um it's a huge thing that we a tool we don't have yet in the field for running these kind of trials so there's a lot of exciting work um that triplet therapeutics have been doing to develop cool ways to to look at this spinal fluid a bit deeper and get some, some more useful insights to what's happening in the brain um, and it's, that's all very exciting, but I think, you know, there's more to learn. I'm seeing that there's a question here about what we're most excited about or looking mm -hmm. forward to in the coming year. And I, I think one of the things is hopefully seeing some of this, some of these learnings from, from animals and this drug development in the somatic instability space moving forward, hopefully, um, into into human trials sometime in the near future and hopefully this year mm -hmm. were there other things i'll ask my fellow panelists are you that you're particularly excited about or that was exciting to you maybe not even necessarily in terms of the the clinical space but you know what what research items you took away from the the conference that were most exciting to you do you want to go first? Aaron? I, I was. You, you looked yeah. like you were ready to go, Lauren. Well, go for it. I really enjoyed the talk. Um, it was one of the very basic science talks. I just thought it was amazing that they're they're now looking at single cell differences in so this uh, by Steve McCarroll's lab, um, and that was on the first day. Um, you know, previously when we analyze to, um, things in science, it's it's from what we call like bulk samples so you take a group of cells and you you lice it or you break them down and get the materials out and you kind of make an average of all of them um 
And the, this one technique was looking at single cells and using just some cool facts that there are you know, differences in everyone's genome that you could like put these cells together from lots of different people, lots of different structures and get an idea of where they originated from, like what cell type, what person, like with these kind of like genetic barcodes, I find just like fascinating. But um, I think maybe for the family perspective, it's not yet something that's meaningful for them. But I think in terms of science and, and things that are going to come out of it, there it will be, I think, help with driving um, new possible treatment opportunities or, or ways to maybe develop biomarkers in the future. Um, but I just thought it was really cool. <laughs> but that's my science nerd. Totally. How about you, Eric? There, okay, I, I'm, I'm going through my head just like there are so many different things that we heard about. But one of the things that stands out to me, and I think I, I think it because of I come from that kind of clinical background was something that you're going to get the chance to hear about later today if you go to Sarah Tabrizi's talk, talking about this new way of categorizing people living with Huntington's disease for a research um for the sake of research, especially as we're getting into the, more of these clinical trial options, looking at the ways that we used to um, develop the inclusion exclusion criteria for studies, even like the Roche trial, right? But now being able to categorize people in a different way so you can do these fairly standardized and uh, stratified groups for looking at these, the things like the Huntington lowering uh, trials and the, you know, I know you had, Lauren, you talked to Peter this morning about Roche mm -hmm. and just kind of what was learned and what they're hoping to learn. And mm -hmm. I think this idea of staging, as Sarah will call it, is a way to say, how do we start moving these trials a little bit earlier in the disease process, looking at where we could potentially have an impact and how do we identify the right people to include in trials. Mm -hmm. And I, I heard myself say that, and I want to just, you know, the right person to participate in the trial is the person who's willing and able to do it. But then we also have to be thoughtful about what that trial is looking at, right? We, the reason we put in inclusion exclusion criteria is because you want to make sure that when you're conducting a trial, you're able to best measure that hypothesis that you're testing to make sure it's happening or not. And that's hard because so many people will come into clinic and be like, I want to be a part of this and find out that they can't be. But if we can define why that is that we're looking at a narrow selection, a narrow group of people, because that increases the likelihood of us learning whether this thing works or not. That was exciting to me. I got, I, I meant to talk about what Sarah's going to talk about later, but then got a little bit more than that, just because, um, yeah. The research is so important and everyone wants to be a part of it, but there's reasons why we look at those smaller, smaller groups. And that reminds me of stuff I brought up in Peter's talk because it's something I know a lot of family members and, and patients get frustrated about um, the inclusion criteria and why it's, it feels quite arbitrary to them, particularly if they're right on the cutoff. Um, uh, I think a highlight um, of what um, came out of the Ross trial on the, the kind of that having to be stopped for, for reasons. And then so subsequently the post hoc analysis, which shows that certain groups were more vulnerable to whatever was happening. Um, whereas maybe these younger, these demographics, the younger um, people with the lower CA, um, a CAP score um, may be less vulnerable or may have the benefit or may, um, if given the right drug dose or something be beneficial. So it's it's really balancing. That's one you're going to find to be able to measure your your effect, which is why you know we're not rushing into prevention trials. Um, I tried to explain this a bit earlier. Um, you if you don't not all of these I, these these concepts of us having to have statistical power in science is based on this idea that you have an effect that you're trying to measure. If you've got a bigger effect size if it's a stronger in like in, in magnitude that means you can measure it in less people um or over long either a shorter time frame so if you start going into people further from onset the tools that we 
typically use are these clinical rating scales that don't change very much in people that don't have clinical symptoms of Huntington's disease. So you either have to wait years until they start manifesting things or that and have thousands of patients to measure it. So this is why we can't rush it yet into prevention trials. And it's um I, I, as much as I believe and that's the way to go, you know, this is why it's taken so long. Um, and it's really exciting that we're moving to the integrated station system, which for me makes total sense because I've kind of always been moving my head towards a, hopefully a future where, you know, where some HD becomes something like AIDS and, and HIV, where, you know, you're HD positive if you test, positive, you know, from birth, you have the HD gene from birth, whether you test or not, um, and you'll be positive or negative. Um, and then hopefully when we have to be a ton of disease modifying therapies that could be treated at different ages and different monitoring tools like the biomarkers that can pick things up far before. So like, for example, with HIV, they can measure your, I don't know what they measure, um, some immunology, thing, like TD cells, <laughs> not, not um, explaining this very well, but they have ways that they can measure things that the virus is doing long before they get any symptoms of, of the disease. And that's where I see the future of HD is, is we have tools that we can pick things up that are happening that allow us to do treatments that keep those things down. And then mm -hmm. people with the gene will never get Huntington's. And that's, what basically the world has done with AIDS, you know, if you have if you take your your prep and, and things like that, then you know people with HIV don't have to get AIDS. And I see that's what I hope in my lifetime that's what it's gonna be like for HD at some point. I think that's a testament to the importance of the work that that you're doing, Lauren. And and you know, to that point there are different kinds of biomarkers and a combination mm -hmm. of those is what's allowing for these staging systems. So looking at images from the brain, tracking the amount of Huntington in blood or biofluids, tracking other markers of disease like neurofilament, which is what Lauren's working on. Um, and Reminds combining me of another that exciting with- exciting thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My work on independently validated, which is really nice as a scientist, but probably means nothing <laughs> to you guys. But um, it, there was um, a cool talk where they're doing what they call omics work in CHDI with all of these major samples that are being collected in this study called HD Clarity. So I hope a lot of you already know about HD Clarity and Enroll HD, which are, Enroll HD is like, everybody can take part in, to, in it. Um, and I hope everybody is, oh, I can see a cat in the background. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so if you're, if you're not already taking part in Enroll, please do. And please, if you're a young at risk mutation carrier or negative, that's really where a lot of, we need more people to kind of step up and take part in um, because of that. But, HD Clarity is a kind of a platform study of Enroll HD, and it is collecting biofluids for the, this kind of research. And they're able to have thousands of sat people and that take part in this out across the world and give multiple or what we call longitudinal samples. So they'll give um, every few years, give another lumbar puncture so we can measure and develop these new biomarkers. But one thing that came out um, in the um, in this study, in some of the first um, attempts to kind of look at what we call omics work in, in proteomics, so trying to look at like loads of proteins at the same same time in the same sample to see if there are any changes. Um, and it was nice to see that the stuff I work on, your filament light protein was majorly changed in these samples um, compared to probably most others. So it was kind of validated a different way of doing what I do, which was much more targeted and specifically measuring neurofilament only. Um, whereas this is like a different kind of mechanism of measuring it. And it's nice that we're seeing both the same things. So. Lauren, you made a point that I, I hope everyone who's listening right now and everyone who's part of this audience in general thinks about is while there might not be a clinical trial that's actively recruiting for that person who is in the really early or even pre-symptomatic stage, it's so important for people to be involved in the research opportunities that are out there. 
a, an observational trial, a trial like um, a trial where you do donate uh, spinal fluid. These are all things that are giving so much information that's going to be used in those realistic future trials. There's a, a lot of times when I was in clinic, I'd have folks be like, yeah, you know, I'm, I don't qualify for this. I don't qualify for that. It's like, well, then please do enroll. Like just get in and be be linked into these studies that are giving us so much information that we're going to be able to apply towards future studies. Um, it allows you to get used to being part of it. Like Lauren said, if you go in for a, a spinal tap once every couple of years, it gets you used to engaging with that team and being involved and talking to folks about living with HD and what it also lets you know what's happening because it gives you that opportunity to hear what's new in the science. And while you're in there meeting with your doctor, you can get updated on these things. So really just a, a plea to engage if you aren't already, just because there's so much to be learned and so much opportunity from doing so. And if you are really want to be in the trials, enroll is a good place to be seen regularly. So your, your information is updated by the clinic so they can kind of pretty quickly find you if, if they have a trial that you seem to have the right characteristics for that you should get in touch with you. It, it really helps speed up that whole process. Um, yeah. yeah, there's uh, um, one thing that I was excited about at this at this conference was to kind of hear more about the other uh, observational trials that are that are coming into a play as part of enroll and there are other ones that are happening locally all over the all over the US all over the world um, and a lot of those are playing into the ways that we're working towards creating trials that might be preventative right so that biomarker discovery and understanding you know using those samples to uncover the newest, drug targets. Mm -hmm. And that also ties into another thing that I was excited about, which was, um, you know, to on totally the opposite end from the clinical stuff is um, the therapeutic development. So really down to the chemistry and the, the structural biology of, of Huntington and, and the proteins that it, that it binds to. And there was some really, really cool work on um, how do you map out the structure of a protein and understand, you know, where you can stick a chemical so that it might open in a particular way to do its job better or, you know, hook up with its dance partner a little bit better in a way that, you know, can, can maybe um, just make the biology go a little bit more smoothly in HD mm -hmm. in places where it doesn't. So. And the aura is not just being a structural biologist nerd. I think it's important to understand, like, it, <laughs> the structure of a protein is literally its function. So like mm -hmm. the more we can understand about its shape and it, its conformation is it, it it means you're better at designing things that can interact with it and change its function and, and whether yeah. that's it's a bad function if it's the mutated protein or there are other ways. So it, 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 the, the, I think you're talking about the keynotes, you're about to talk about the keynote talk from, is it Dr. Baker? Or Dr. Baker? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I mean, that's about as much as I took away from it. My structural biology, as much as I can be a, a nerd about this stuff, my structural biology is, same, is same. not quite where, you know, someone like Dr. Rachel Harding says, she's also on the HD Buzz team, and she's herself a structural oh, biologist. She is like um, the smartest person I know. <laughs> she's so great to, to follow. She just like slurps out these like random facts about protein <laughs> yeah she gets very excited about it and so and so do we um but yeah I mean it's it's that was just the very basics of what I took away from it is that there are concepts outside of the HD field in things as basic as the structure of of proteins that are really quickly going to be able to be applied to the to the development of drugs for HD yeah. and I was th I had my like biomarker hat and could see how it could be applied to make better immuno acids or better tools that we can use to to quantify proteins or or understand proteins. Um, so as we like to say, science is accumulative, and um, fortunately, the HD field are good at collaborating with people and also getting new skills into the field that will fast will. will make us progress quicker. 
That's what I found so fascinating about his talk is this was someone who's not from the world of HD at all and works with artificial intelligence to determine the structure of things that you know have been worked on for years and he can plug stuff into a computer that spits something out that is confirmed by an expert in that area that says yeah you're pretty spot on with this right and so how you get someone with that area of expertise to come into a space like HD and say how can you know, they're going to think about things differently they're going to partner with the scientists who are already working on it that might bring it just a slightly different perspective to it I think there's just so much so much opportunity for for that additional learning and that additional learning brings us you know additional outcomes eventually so um I just said something that I've been thinking about all along while the science part is so awesome I know for people who are living with Huntington's disease so often I would hear it's I'm so glad to hear you find it fascinating but it's not happening fast enough right and I think that's something that we balance all the time is how do you how do you I, Lauren and Laura, I'll turn it to you guys. How do you as scientists say, yeah, the stuff that is happening on a cellular level that we're learning about is fascinating. How do we balance that with the people who are still living with Huntington's disease on a daily basis, right? As their experience with living with the disease changes, how do we balance the excitement over something so small to the person who says, I need it in clinic yesterday? Yeah, it's, it's extremely hard and, you know, it's hard to kind of explain that we scientific community was crushed you know last year as uh, not as much but it was an entire community was crushed uh, the results last year um i know we had one message earlier from edith um in malta who after kind of the trial was halted is now confused confused about therapeutics or the new therapeutic approaches um, and we have talked a lot about our opinions on, on some of those um, and other medications. And um, but she said, you know, will they be available anytime soon? And it's really hard when we have to kind of go back a step and and say, well, you know, like with the Roche one, which was the forefront. Um, and if it had worked, it would have been in the next kind of couple of years. We'd be rolling that out uh, or finding out if that worked to be marketed. But unfortunately now they have to go back a step and do another trial, which would need we still need a, a, a kind of another trial after that before we get to market. So um yeah, it's still kind of looking at the five to ten years, you know, in my head for a, a, these kind of therapeutic tr trials to come to market. You know, we're really working with very advanced therapies. Um, for a lot of these, you know, that we didn't mention anything about kind of the, the ones that are getting brain surgery to have like a, vir a viral virus kind of transport the drug into your brain or into the right, which is super cool and sounds like alien science um, or sci-fi stuff, um, but it's happening and we're testing in humans. There's also, um, we, we had um, Leslie Thompson tell us about the the new wave of stem cell therapies that are coming in. So stem cells are the kind of precursors to all of our, the rest of our cells. So um, they can produce, they can be um, produce any kind of cell type um, in the body. Um, so they're working on ways to kind of harness that as, as, as possible that you can implant these into parts of the brain that have perhaps been degenerated like the striatum um, and hopefully, you know, support new cell growth or um, support the system. Whereas a lot of these, you know, approaches may stop the disease, but they won't bring back the cells, you know, that have been lost. So having another approach like that is, again, I don't think on its own is going to be perfect for the whole of the disease, but at a what particular stage with everything else is going to be, I think, super important, which, yeah, it's it's exciting that everything's progressing. It's not just, you know, we always talk about the Huntington lowering stuff and things, but, and there's other treatments um, like other symptomatic treatments that I think neurocrine drug, I don't know a lot about it, but I think it's another drug for move, the movements of HD. I don't know if yeah. Eric, if you know more about that. Yeah, I think that's, we've talked so much about the, 
potentially disease modifying treatments, that there's a whole world of symptomatic treatment still being worked on. Uh, Neurocrine will be, is working with another um, Korea uh, management drug. Uh, SAGE is interestingly working on something that can help with co- cognitive symptoms in hunting pets, right? So mm-hmm. I think it's, there's so much happening where it's, you know, we're, we're focused on how do you change the disease trajectory itself, but while we're working on that and hopefully getting closer to actually seeing something that's going to do that, what can we do to help the person live better with Huntington's today? And we're seeing those studies still happening and going into clinical trials now too. So it's, mm-hmm. I was thinking this earlier, Lauren, when we were talking, it's like, how many shots are we taking on goal? You know, we're taking yeah. so many more shots today than we were even five years ago. And the more shots you take, the more likely you are to score. So, mm-hmm. and I think it's important yeah. to say they're all like a lot of them, even the hunting and lowering ones are very different and have their own benefits and disadvantages. Mm-hmm. So I think we are going to need multiple shots to affect people as much as, as possible, even though they're technically, you know, approaching the same. So I don't have an opinion on what I think is better because I, I don't think anyone's better. I think they're all have their own niche. The only ones that are probably in anywhere very similar to each other are the virus and PPC drug, which is a small molecule that targets a similar mechanism that is a hunting gene lowering therapy. So it will be kind of given the same way through oral pills. Um, and it's to do, it's, it's not specific to, not specific to the bad Huntington or the mutant Huntington. Um, so, you know, it just might have different potencies, but we don't know that um, until it's tested. But yeah. apart from that, every other company's come out at a different angle, um, which is cool. It's like, yeah. Yeah, it's good to have healthy competition in the in the space. And I think to answer Eric's question a little bit, I mean, he and I are, are talking to folks every week who are feeling these kinds of frustrations with with research. And you know, research moves fast and it moves really slow. It moves really slow for somebody who's, who's in a position of, of, of watching their, their loved ones suffer. And so, you know, I think sort of keeping in mind that there are all these different approaches, there are ways that we can help folks treat symptoms. Now there are small research studies doing things, for example, like testing, melatonin um, in a, you know, in a controlled way to understand, you know, can we, can we do some research to really say, hey, this is a good thing for you to do as a Which would be particularly good now. in the UK because we have to get our, our melatonin when we come to the US, the US because it's really hard to get melatonin in the UK, which is very oh, frustrating no, to our HD doctors <laughs> who know that it works very well for um, HD patients and their sleep. So, right. Yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, just knowing that there are things that we can, can do to, to help folks, not only in research, but just, you know, from a, from a clinical perspective, and there's all these different aspects of HD biology that are, that are being researched. And, you know, to the point of all these different types of Huntington lowering therapies, these different folks who are focused on somatic instability and other aspects of HD biology, um, you know, it's not like all our eggs are in one basket. So that, you know, even with the, with trials coming to a close unsuccessfully, there's, there's other things in the works because we're not just, we don't think that one way is the, is the best way. And mm-hmm. also, you know, even if these, even if the criteria for participating in these studies is really narrow in terms of who can participate, that doesn't mean that it's not going to help a wider swath of the HD population. So these mm-hmm. are kind of some of the hopeful things that, that and we like to, to talk touch about. on the um, the going too slow and too fast. Um, I think one thing we've learned from the, the halting of the Tom and Erson program is that it might be an example of going too fast. So um, we were all delighted that they skipped straight to phase three, but they missed out on important information on how to, you know, finding the right dose that wouldn't be harmful. And that's, you know, why they're going back into do a phase two with a certain group of people. But perhaps if we did that in the first place, you know, they wouldn't have gotten to this stage. So it's hard. No one wanted to slow that down. You know, we all were excited that that was going straight and it was based on a good 
rationale at the time. Um, but that's why, you know, we can't speed up some of these things because it can lead to, you know, safety issues and, and things like that. So uh, it's hard to, it is slow and it really is slow and it's frustratingly slow when you've got Huntington's disease because, you know, Huntington's disease doesn't slow down for anyone, unfortunately, until we get these therapies um, underway. So Lauren, with what you just said, I think is it, it's not, I, 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 I'm wondering if it's how we frame it, right? Like it feels mm -hmm. slow to the community, but it's also very deliberate, right? And yeah. that was the point that you just made. There's a reason that we, that science yeah. moves like this because we want to make sure that it's doing A, what we hope it's going to do and, and no B, that it's not harming anyone, right? Yeah, and, and that's, it's hard to, to, you know, our 50 patients will do anything, you know, and that's, you right. know, we have to, bear that in mind and we want to protect our patients and our families um and it feels you know harsh when they can't get into trials and things like that and it's going slowly but it's it's these are still new molecules and drugs and we don't really know what you know a few hundred people test them is not a lot of information for what a drug does to a human beings so um it's it's important to remember that and we can't take advantage of our population's enthusiasm to to we have a position of power as scientists and, and clinicians and, and and people making these drugs to make sure we're not gonna do anything harmful. It's crazy useful, how fast an hour um, goes, you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know. We've got two couple of minutes left, but there's lots of uh, useful information being put into the chat by Jen and Jenna, um, yeah. Leora. So yeah, she just highlighted the trial finder, which is an amazing resource at HCSA for finding um, new studies and trials that might be close to you. Um, yeah, please. Enroll can sometimes be tricky to find about where your closest site is, and it might not be up to date. So if you are connected to a clinic, um, maybe going directly to them. Um, there is a page. Um, I think there's a better website than that to actually take you directly to where all of the, um, let me find that. And the enroll website was recently updated. It's, it's really good. Yeah, but I was going to give it to exactly the right page because oh, okay. it's sometimes not very intuitive to find where all the list of, of sites are. Um, um, well, I would just like to say thank you very much for such an informative session. It's, it, it's great to hear um, uh, you talk back and forth and in a language that is uh, easily understood for, for those of us in the community that uh, may not necessarily have such a strong background in science and research and to give us so much hope coming out of uh, CHDI's conference about what, what uh, we have to look forward to in the future. Um, so in terms of um, HGO's conference, we have a quick uh, 15 minute break and um, following our 15 minute break, we will have a research update from Wave Life Sciences on track two. And then on track one, we'll have a discussion about um, going through the genetic testing process or starting the genetic testing process, but not having finished it. Um, so thanks again, um, Dr. Eric Johnson, Dr. Leora Fox, and Dr. Lauren Byrne for that very informative mm -hmm. presentation. Um, we have lots of booths in the exhibit hall, so you can check that out when you're on your break, and we look forward to seeing you for our next sessions. Thank you very thanks much. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much.